So I want to throw a question out for you guys to chew on as we're working through this passage. It's a question that I've thought about a lot as a Christian, especially as a, a Christian that has a desire to tell people about the Lord. The question is this, how do we preach the gospel to people that think they already believe it? I don't know about you guys, in my experience, um, I very rarely run into an atheist or an agnostic, although I have run into a few. Uh, I very rarely run into someone that's actually a Buddhist, a universalist, a Muslim, a Hindu, um, very rarely. What I run into most commonly are people that claim Christianity but believe in none of its tenets. How do you preach the gospel to somebody that says and thinks they are secure in it but does not believe it? It's what I want to consider with you um, this morning. You know, the gospel is really offensive, um, and if you don't know that, then you've probably never preached it. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the gospel is offensive. Jesus' message, it went over like a ton of bricks. You know, we think about the early church and we think about the first century and Jesus and his disciples and we romanticize it and think, what would it have been like to sit at the table with Jesus as he broke bread? Uh, you want to know? It would have been terrifying because everybody hated Jesus. He, hadn't, he, had, he went to the cross with no friends other than his mom and Mary and a couple of the disciples that didn't reject him. Jesus' message didn't make him any friends. He was very offensive. He was offensive to everybody. At least he did it equally. I mean, he made everybody mad. His message cut against the grain of everything in his culture, just like it cuts against the grain in everything in our culture. And we're surprised when we tell people about the gospel and, it, and we get unfavorable responses. Think about it for a minute. Jesus called people to a radical abandonment of self-love. What does our culture preach? Radical self-love, self-esteem. You need to believe in yourself. You have what it takes. It's seeped and leaked into Christianity, hasn't it? It's like this toxic thing. Believe in yourself. Jesus preached the complete opposite. Jesus preached the resignation of not only self-esteem, but also self-love. He preached the resignation of living for this world. What does our culture preach? Live for this world. It's all about this life. He called himself the son of God. What does our culture think about Jesus? He was just a good man. Jesus said that he was the only exclusive truth. Okay, not one of many truths. He was the truth. What does our culture tell us? That there is no truth, right? It's relative. All truths are true at the same time. Jesus taught and called people to complete surrender to his lordship. Our culture preaches self-rule. We praise the self-made man, don't we? Jesus preached for his followers to take up their cross and follow in his suffering, and they did, didn't they? Almost all of Jesus' followers died within 30 years, 40 years. They were martyred. Our culture obsesses about comfort and finding easier ways to do things. Jesus said, you're signing up to die. Jesus loved the social, socially ostracized. He loved the people that could not benef benefit him anyway, in any way socially. He loved the people that were outcasts. He loved the people that were sinners, that were scum. And what does our culture do? Our culture obsesses over the most powerful, the most influential we name drop, we work our way up the corporate ladder, right, by having the right relationships with the right people. Everything Jesus did was absolutely absurd to his culture, and everything that he preached is absolutely absurd to our culture. Why do we think it's any different today? Now, let me suggest to you, as a Christian who is mandated to preach the gospel, that was the great commission that we make disciples, you basically have two decisions. You can either preach the gospel, or you can change it. And I actually think more people than you realize have actually changed it because it's offensive. Jesus told this parable in Matthew chapter 13. You're probably familiar with it. He said, a man went out with some seed and he, he grabs the seed and he throws the seed where, wherever it goes. 
And the seed, of course, is the gospel. And every seed is the same. It's all the same gospel. But there's four different outcomes of how that seed lands. The first outcome is what I, I call the angry earplugger. Okay, that's the hard soil. Like, nope, don't want to hear it. You guys ever come across one of those? Okay, don't want to hear it, don't care, don't need Jesus, don't need your gospel, don't talk to me. Okay, that's the seed that kind of fell out of the pouch and hit the path. Then there's the second seed. This is the distracted world lover. That's the seed that got flung over onto some, some soil that was already um, really populated by a bunch of weeds. And there wasn't really room for it to grow. And as it began to grow, the weeds just choked it out. Jesus said, those are the cares of the world, right? It's like, yeah, gospel sounds great, but man, the world is just so much better. That's what that seed says. The third seed is the self-sustained soundbite follower. <laughs> this, is the, this is the seed that sprouts up immediately, but it turns out there's really no depth. And the seed has no, has no sustenance because it's self-sustained. So the sun comes out, scorches it. And then, of course, the fourth seed is the regenerate true believer, and that is the seed that falls on the good soil. Now, think about this. This is really interesting. Jesus says, odds are that when you spread the gospel, three out of four people will deny it. Interesting. Three out of four. Now, I want to show you guys something really quick. This is the state of our country right now. Uh, throw up that first slide. So the Barna Group research did, did, a, did a poll, and, and they looked, tried to figure out kind of where is America at. Um, and this is what they found. 73% in 2016, 20, or 73% of people in America claim to be Christians. Is that surprising to you? It's a little surprising to me. 20% no faith. 6% other, so an, another religion, and 1% whatever, don't care, okay? So 73% of that, now that, that's pretty interesting, is it, considering that Jesus said that three out of the four seeds will at least look like they're believing the gospel. And what do we see in our country? 75%. At least claim Christianity. Now once you double click on this and you start pressing into it a little bit more, they did a little bit more research, go to the next slide, and they found that out of that 73%, only 35% of America could actually state that they were born-again Christians. And that's not just do they know the lingo, born-again. Th these were people, only 35% of people that actually said they had an experience with God where they actually put their faith in him. So take away 35 from 73, whatever you get, all those people just claim Christianity because it's what they claim. They have no real interaction with God, no real relationship. 23% of Americans said that they were Bible-minded. That means that's their authority, at least they claim to. And here's the interesting part. When you get down to what would be considered an evangelical Christian, it drops all the way down to 7%. Now, you might be asking, if you're critically thinking right now, okay, but what is an evangelical Christian? Is that just a term that people are supposed to know? Okay, well, here was the criteria that they used to determine whether or not someone was an evangelical Christian. They asked them seven questions, and if they could not agree to these seven questions, they were not an evangelical Christian. They were these. Number one, saying their faith is very important in their life today. Okay, fair. Number two, believing they have a, personable, a personal responsibility to share their religious beliefs about Christ. Number three, believing Satan exists. Four, believing Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth. Number five, asserting that the Bible is accurate and all that it teaches. Six, believing that eternal salvation is possible only through grace, not works. And seven, describing God as the all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect deity who created the universe and still rules it today. Now, those were the criteria. Those seven questions literally took a number from 73% to 7%. Now, those are not tough questions for a Christian to answer. Is the Bible true? Yeah. Was Jesus sinless? Yeah. Like, th those are dividing questions. Now, how interesting is it that Jesus said this is exactly what it would be like? You're going to spread the gospel, and unfortunately, a very small amount of people are actually going to believe it. Here's the thing that's really hard to swallow. Jesus said that two of those seeds would actually begin to grow, meaning they believed the gospel to some degree, right? Meaning that they were okay with it, they were fine with it. The, the seed that fell on the, the, the shallow soil and the seed that fell into the weeds, they were both like, woohoo, gospel, great. Okay, so 75% of these seeds are on board with the gospel, yet literally two out of four of them are perishing and will not inherit eternal life. 
Now, I don't think that those two soils actually knew that they weren't saved until the sun came out and scorched the one and the weeds grew up and choked the other. And I don't think that 50% of the people, or whatever you want to say it, think they're Christians, realize that they have believed a false gospel. They are not believing the gospel Jesus preached. Now, again, how do we preach to people that think they are saved? Because this is what we're dealing with. Majority of the people you will encounter in your workplace, in your family, in your home will probably think they are saved. How do we preach to them? Well, how did Jesus do it? How did Jesus preach to them? And who Jesus preaches to here and engages with here in our text is really similar because both of the parties that Jesus engages with both thought they were fine. They both thought they were fine. They had their ticket punched. So let's take a look at it. Now before we get into that, I've got to give you a little bit of background. Okay? A little bit of background to get you up to speed. It's Passover week in our text. It's the last seven days of Jesus' ministry. The most happens in the last seven days of Jesus' ministry. Um, all the Gospels devote the most time to those last seven days. In the book of John, it's like from chapter 13 all the way to the end. It's just the last seven days. A lot happens. And Passover week is significant because it's a pilgrimage for all of Israel to march uh, for the week into Jerusalem, because that's how God said to do it, and celebrate this feast together, where each household would have a Passover lamb, and that Passover lamb would be sacrificed, and then it would become uh, dinner for that night, and, and then they, they would celebrate and remember God's redemption of Israel and the need for atonement for them. What's significant about where we're at in the book of Luke right now is that Jesus, and Jeremy said this last week if you were here, but Jesus is the Passover lamb. John the Baptist understood that, didn't he? He said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, the Passover lamb, has entered into the gates of Jerusalem, and just like what happened in the week of Passover, the high priests are going to examine the lambs to make sure they're without spot and blemish. And what we're looking at here in this text is Jesus is being examined by the high priests, as crooked as they are. They're examining him. It's significant. Now, Jesus, in the last two chapters, has systematically irritated every single person he possibly could. In chapter 19, he walks into the temple, which was the moneymaker, as we'll see, for the Sanhedrin, the most powerful people in Jerusalem and Israel, okay? He walks into the temple, and he takes it over, shuts down their business, which actually, you might note, was the moment that the Sanhedrin decided this guy's got to die. They weren't going to kill him just for blasphemy, but they would kill him when he interfered with their money, their dirty money. That was the moment they said, Jesus has got to go, okay? So he, chapter 19, he goes in, he takes over the temple. In chapter 20, he gives one of the most brutal parables about the religious leadership and how God is going to judge them because they've literally been unrighteous stewards of Israel. And then, you know, he had a shot to maybe win some credibility with the zealots or the, the people that were hoping to kick Rome out of their country. And he totally blew that because when they brought him a denarius, he said, yeah, go ahead and keep paying taxes. I mean, he just blew it. He didn't blow it. He knew what he was doing. But he completely made everybody mad. He went to the cross with, with no base, with no support. This is what's been happening. And Jesus is now teaching on some of the most important things that he's going to say in his life. He comes across a group of people called the Sadducees. Can you guys say Sadducees? Okay, now we talk a lot about the Pharisees here because they're all through the Gospels. But the Sadducees come up a lot less, so I need to introduce you to them, okay, because they're not to be confused with the Pharisees. Putting them in the same group is like putting Democrats and Republicans together. This just doesn't work, okay? They're different. In fact, they don't like each other. They don't get along very well at all, even though, as we'll see, they're very similar. Okay, who are the Sadducees? You might jot these things down. The Sadducees, first of all, they were the aristocratic mafia, they were the aristocratic mafia. They held the monopoly on the high priesthood. And whoever was the high priest basically called the shots on how the temple functioned. The temple was a big moneymaker. It's like Disneyland. It draws thousands of people. Okay, and like Jeremy talked about last week, the money changers were ripping people off. 
the, the sacrificial uh, lambs were being sold to people in exorbitant prices to people that were foreigners from outside of Jerusalem, outside of the country. And the Sadducees were making money hand over fist on these guys. They were the aristocratic mafia. Caiaphas, the high priest at the time, he was a Sadducee. He was part of this group. Now, there's all, there was a small group of Sadducees, but they were the powerfully elite Kind of an interesting side note, Caiaphas' father-in-law, Annas, who was the former high priest, a lot of people think even though he wasn't the high priest anymore, he was actually sort of like this behind-the-scenes mob boss who was actually calling all the shots. His son-in-law basically answered to him, very mafia, very mafia-esque. That's why when, and we'll see this in a few weeks, but when they bring Jesus and rest him illegally at night, they bring him to Annas' house, not Caiaphas, even though Caiaphas was the high priest. Kind of interesting. Not only were they aristocratic mafia, they, they made their money from the temple. They were extremely rich, extremely powerful, and extremely cruel. Josephus specifically says those words. They were extremely cruel. They made the Pharisees seem like puppies, okay? These guys were terrible, like El Chapo meets Benny Hen. I mean, these guys are just like, they're just religious, terrible people, okay? Okay. They were part of the Sanhedrin, the council, the high council. They were skeptical traditionalists. That means they held to the, what they would consider the traditional views of Judaism and did not believe any of the supernatural stuff. They didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in demons, they didn't believe in resurrection or afterlife or God's providence or any of those things. They held to what was called, or what is called, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Everything else, oral tradition, they didn't believe it, they didn't hold to it. And because they didn't see a lot about angels or demons or resurrection in the Torah, they didn't believe in it, which was convenient for them because they could do whatever they wanted to do in this life. No answer to God in the end, right? Do whatever you want. They were technically theists, but functionally atheists. Outwardly strict nationalists, secretly political opportunists. In other words, they pretended like they cared about the nation Israel, but in reality, they were in bed with Herod. They made money off Rome. They were cool with Roman occupation because for them, it lined their pockets. They were self-made pragmatists. They rejected the idea of divine inter intervention. God, God is not sovereign. God's not working in, in, in the world. God is distant. God is off doing his own thing. He's let us make our own decisions. We make our own destiny. I am the, what is it? captain of my salvation, right? Sound kind of familiar to you? They were moralistic materialists. In other words, they did, quote unquote, the law so that they could get blessing from God. They obeyed God so that he would give them stuff, give them favor, so they thought. That's classic legalism, by the way. If I do something good for God, he'll do something good for me. Watch out for that. So, now that we know them, let's get into the text. Verse 27. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. Okay, we know who these guys are now, right? They asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So they're citing to Jesus a, a law from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Leverite marriage law. Leverite marriage law. This was a social grace that God stitched into the law in order so that if a woman and her husband dies and passes away before she's been able to have kids and has someone to grow up and take care of her and be her retirement and her stability, that the closest of kin, the kinsman redeemer, would marry her and bring her into um, the house. Now, that might seem kind of weird, like in our culture, like seriously, I'd have to marry my sister-in-law, that's weird. But in reality, in that time, it was God's providential grace because the family unit was intensely important. So you allowed you to stay in your home, allowed you to stay in your family, allowed you to stay in your tribe, um, it was a grace of God for a temporary amount of time. We see this in Ruth and Boaz, right? Boaz was Ruth's kinsman redeemer. And by the way, Jesus is ours. He purchased us. He married us, the church. Verse 29, so they bring this up. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. Now, you think at this point, they would stop marrying this lady, right? Because everyone she marries dies. <laughs> okay, like, it's just, it's just terrible. 
Now, we don't even know if this is real or not. They're probably just making this story up. Uh, it's just a little far-fetched to think it's real. Likewise, all seven left no children and died. Verse 32. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, okay, now, when they would say that, they would go, look at me, in the resurrection, because these guys don't believe in it. They're mocking it. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Now, what are they doing here? This is a smart play. This is their go-to example, right? They've used this before because they're arguing with the Pharisees all the time. And the Pharisees, man, they're always talking about weird stuff. We have, a, we have, we have um, historical writings of Pharisees arguing about stupid things like, when we get resurrected, will we be naked or will we have clothes? I mean, they would write volumes about stupid things like that. And the Sadducees, who are pragma pragmatists, they're like, these Pharisees are ridiculous. Let's go make them look stupid. So they come up with this great, uh, this great you know, illustration, they think, to show how silly the resurrection actually is. And when Jesus comes into town and the Pharisees can't seem to get much traction on making them look stupid, the Sadducees go, okay, let's take a swing at this thing. I got the perfect argument for Jesus. He's not going to know what to say to this. Now, obviously, they knew Jesus believed in the resurrection. Why? Because he said he would resurrect. He said he was the resurrection. He did resurrect people. So obviously they know Jesus believes in resurrection. So they come to him with this outlandish argument, this argument that they would have used before. And what they're trying to point out here is, look, Jesus, if resurrection is true, then God is endorsing eternal polygamy. Right? Because the assumption, the presupposition that they're working off of is that marriage is going to be exactly the same in the resurrection as it is in this life. So if she's got seven husbands and she gets resurrected, and it, then God's endorsing eternal polygamy. Something's wrong there. That, that can't be right. That's contradictory. So therefore, the resurrection must not be real. Okay? That's what they're getting at. Now, just a side note for whatever it's worth. It is interesting to me that cults love talking about eternal sex and eternal marriage. Like the Mormons. Like, they say they read the Bible. They say they believe in the King James Bible. It's right here. Jesus is going to say in two seconds that marriage is not happen in the afterlife. But the Mormons literally have this idea that, that you are going to go populate your own planet through eternal celestial sex. It's totally weird. Jesus is very clear about this. Now, what the Mormons are doing in that is they're taking what they want in this life and they're assuming it's going to be in the afterlife. And what Jesus is going to say is actually it's completely different than what you think. You're completely off. So listen to how Jesus responds to them uh, in verse 34. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. Now when he says this age, by the way, when he says this age, he's not talking about Christian or non-Christian. He's talking about the people that are born before the new heavens and the new earth. Does everybody understand that? This age, okay? So if you're in this age, you're sitting here, okay? We're all in this age. Verse 35, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, the new heavens, the new earth, and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Why? For they cannot die anymore. So there's no reason to have marriages anymore because there's no reason to have kids because everyone lives forever. That's his point. Because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now, you might notice, as I've just read that, that Jesus uses the word sons over and over and over again. He said sons of this age. He says sons of the resurrection. He says sons of God. When he uses the word sons there, it's important to note that he's specifically talking about a certain kind or, or, or like he's not saying like a paternal sons, like this is my son. He's saying sons as though the byproduct of something. He's saying it as a class or as a kind. So for example, uh, those that are in the world and that are lost are sons of Adam. Why? Because they're a byproduct of Adam's sin. Jesus at times called people the son of the devil. What did he mean? He meant that you're the byproduct of the devil's work. And here he says that in the resurrection, those that are counted worthy will be the sons of God, the sons of the resurrection. In other words, you'll be the byproduct of a new humanity, a new kingdom, a new world, a new reality. He distinguishes this world from the next, this age from the next. He does it very purposefully 
Flip in your Bibles really quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I just want to show you one thing here, and this is really cool. 1 Corinthians 15. Um, if you are looking for some thing to study tonight, go back and read 1 Corinthians 15. This is Paul's thesis on resurrection. It's super interesting. Paul says this in verse 50 of 15, 1 Corinthians. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Anybody in here feel like they are perishable? Okay, I'm only, I'm only like 30 and I already fe- I'm feeling perishable already. It's, it's terrible. Okay, we are perishable. Our bodies are perishable. They are decaying. Okay, I've heard it said before, life is a, is a war with gravity and you lose, right? I mean, it's, that's just the reality. Okay, we are perishing. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we won't all die because there's something called the terminal generation. That's the generation that'll be alive when Jesus comes back. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking about resurrection, getting a new body. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying, it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Do you understand, listen to me, the importance of Jesus' resurrection? It wasn't enough for him just to go to the cross. The cross accomplished your salvation, your atonement, your justification, you understand that? Paid for your sins. The resurrection was the rebirth of an entirely new species of resurrected, glorified humans that will inhabit God's kingdom. You're saying, Sam, that sounds totally weird. Okay, but it's here. Jesus, he sa- it says in Corinthians that Jesus is the firstborn of many. He was the first to be resurrected. He was the first to be given a glorified body. And like him, we're going to follow him into that new existence. He's the first fruits. Sam, why does that matter? It matters because eternal life is not floatiness. That's how we all think about eternal life. That's how the Sadducees were thinking about it. That's why they thought it was ridiculous. That's how the Pharisees were thinking about it. That's how America thinks about heaven. We think about it as floatiness. That sounds terrible. It's not floatiness. It's a material place. It's a real, physical, tangible heavens and earth. And we will have real, physical, material bodies with senses and nerves and pleasure and enjoyment and we will work and we will eat and we will do and we will conquer and we will explore and we will do all this with a resurrected body and without a resurrected body, we don't get that. It's important. And it's all amazing because it's all to the glory of God. He says specifically, if you notice in our text, he says that we will be equal to angels. What does he mean by that? He's not saying that we're going to turn into angels. That's totally not true. When people tell you, oh, we're going to be angels in heaven. No. Sorry. He's going to be equal to angels. What he means by that specifically is that like the angels, you will be eternally fashioned. Like the angels, you have an increased capacity to experience and worship God. That like the angels, you will have the perfect ability to carry out the will of God. I'm excited for that. I feel the call of God on my life and so often I'm frustrated by my own inability to carry it out. My sin, my flesh, my weakness, my insecurity, my guilt, my shame. In the new heavens and the new earth, like angels, we will be able to carry out the will of our Father perfectly. Not hindered anymore. Some of you are feeling that physically. You're feeling your body wear out and you want to go do the things you used to be able to do. You want to go serve the Lord and your body won't let you. You're stuck inside. You can barely get in here and sit down. Let me encourage you. The resurrection is coming. The age to come is coming and you will have a new body, a body that is not hindered, does not get tired, a body that can worship God perpetually and enjoy him forever, serve him with complete, unbridled, un, like nothing's gonna stop you from worshiping and carrying out the will of God. Isn't that exciting? I mean, we just don't talk about that in Christianity. I don't know why. It's all through the Bible. The reason is because we think heaven 
It's just going to be some eternal perpetual floating on a cloud. That's lame. I just don't want that. I have no interest in that. The Bible doesn't talk about that. Jesus is saying, you guys don't get it. The age to come is going to be completely different. He says that you're not going to get married in heaven because we're all going to live forever. Now, some of you, I hope all of you, those of you that actually like your spouse, I love my spouse, and this makes me sad. I think, wait a minute, I'm not going to be with my spouse in eternity. That's sad. Now, let me encourage you guys on something. When you are in the age to come, and sin is no longer dividing you and your spouse, and pride and selfishness and all the things that you guys constantly butt heads because of, unfortunately, when all of that is removed, you will be closer to your spouse than you have ever been before. And I believe that my wife and I will have fellowship in heaven in a way that we've never been able to experience in this earth because all of these things will be removed. So look forward to that. Jesus not only distinguishes the ages, he also distinguishes the resurrected. You notice that in verse 35. And this is worth noting. He says, those who are considered worthy to be resurrected. Now, that doesn't mean that those that are not saved won't be resurrected. We're all going to be resurrected. Some will be given eternal bodies unto judgment, and some will be given eternal bodies unto heaven in worship. Okay? But there is a distinction, and the worthiness that he's talking about is not your own. There's not going to be a giant scale in heaven when you get there and God said, oh, looks like whoop, you were worthy. No, your worthiness is attached to the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only way. Look at 37. Then Jesus proves the resurrection. 37, he says this. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, for all live to him. Now, I love this. Jesus is like, oh, you guys only believe in the Torah? Sweet. Let me prove the resurrection from what you believe in. Go to the book of Exodus, he says. Take a look at what Moses writes down. Your boy, the guy that you listen to, the guy that you think is the only one that was able to write scripture. What does he say? He says, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they are living. God is still the God of them. Does that make sense? That's Jesus' point. He's proving the resurrection from the scriptures. And he does such a good job that in verse 39, then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you've spoken well. For they no longer dared to ask him any questions. <laughs> the Sadducees took one shot at Jesus, and he shot him down. And they were like, that's enough of that. I mean, th they were afraid that he was going to undo their worldview. Because when you undo someone's worldview, they have to reform it. I mean, do you understand that? When you preach the gospel to somebody, the reason that they are sometimes so quick to dodge it is because you are literally shaking the foundation of everything they've built their life on. These Sadducees built their entire life on an idea that they were going to have no eternal accountability and that this life was heaven for them. And Jesus comes along and he starts shaking that, in fact, violently. <laughs> And what do they do? They run for the hills. That's why when people are running from Jesus, they do not go to church. When people are wanting their sin, wanting to live in rebellion, wanting to not repent, they stay as far away from the Bible and the pulpit, or they go to churches where they're not going to hear the gospel, where they can sit comfortably. That's the reality. Then notice next, Jesus asks them a question. Now, up until this point, they've been asking all the questions. They've had the agenda. They've asked the questions that were important to them, right? They asked about taxes. They asked about marriage. They asked about all these things that was important to them. And then Jesus says, okay, my turn. Give me the mic. I'm going to ask you a question. And Jesus wastes no time. He asks the single most important question anyone could ever ask in the entire universe. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Here's how he does it. Verse 41. He said to them, how can they, meaning the general populace of Jews in Israel, how can they say that the Christ, okay, now that means Messiah. You understand that? Christ is not Jesus' last name. It means Messiah. That's the one that was predicted to come and save Israel. So how can they say that the Messiah is David's son? 
For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to mine, I was quoting Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now picture this in your head. The Pharisees, he's talking to the Pharisees now, okay, he switched his attention over. The Pharisees were the, they were the commentators. They were the, they were the experts on the scriptures. They had commentaries after commentaries, volumes and volumes and volumes on interpreting the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus pulls out the one scripture that they have blank pages for. You know why? Because they don't get it. And they know it. It's like when you get asked that one question you don't know the answer to, you're like, oh. He just went there. He went to Psalm 110. He went to Psalm 110. We don't have an answer to Psalm 110. We don't have an explanation for that, at least one that holds water. Jesus knows it. Here's why it's a particularly interesting text, and here's why the Pharisees couldn't figure out how to interpret it. Because it's obviously messianic. What I mean by messianic is it's talking about the future Messiah. David sees this vision of the Lord. You'll notice in your Bible it's all caps, L-O-R-D. That means Yahweh. The Lord says to David's Lord in the Old Testament, Adonai, which is a word used to describe God. Yahweh says to my Adonai. Why is there two gods here? Pharisees can't figure that out. Jews are strict monotheists. This doesn't make any sense. They don't understand. Even more than that, if you understand an honor-shame society, a patriarchal society, dads don't call their kids Lord. David lived six, seven hundred years before Jesus, before Messiah. How in the world is David calling his great, 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 great grandson, Lord, God, Adonai? And the New Testament, the Greek Septuagint, which is the way the Greeks translated uh, the, the Hebrew, which is the Bible Jesus would have read, okay? Um, the words is literally the same word for Yahweh as it is for Adonai. He says, the kurios said to my kurios. In other words, God said to my God. It's just confusing. Pharisees don't get it, and Jesus does. And he brings it up, and he says, so answer me. How is Messiah David's son and David's God? How does that work? It doesn't make any sense. And you know what the Pharisees say? Nothing. You know why? They don't get it. What is Jesus getting at? Well, there's only one possible answer to that. Messiah has to be God and man. He's the God man. He is both God and both man. The New Testament clearly understood this. The authors clearly understood this. Look at what Paul said in Romans 1. I'll read it. Romans 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets, including David, David was a prophet, in the Holy Scriptures, listen to this, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the Spirit. It's both. He's the son of David and he's Lord. Peter says the same thing when he's preaching in the book of Acts in the second chapter, verse 34. He says, Jesus, this Jesus God raised up and of that we all are, are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing us, Pentecost. For David did not ascend into heaven, I'm sorry, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, quoting the same text, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Listen to Peter's conclusion. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's the God man. Sam, why? I don't care. Okay, well, you should care. Because he had to be God because only God could atone for the sins of the world. He had to be man because only man could die. He had to be man because only man can atone for the sins of a man. He had to be both. This was God's great plan. And Jesus is revealing this to them and they completely miss it. They don't understand it. Why? Because they don't have regenerate minds. They are still thinking about Jesus in terms of this world. Lastly, verse 45, he condemns the scribes. As in hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. 
They love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, the places of honor at feasts. They devour widows' houses, and for a pretense or a show, they make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Do you think Jesus was all about postmodern 2019 tolerance? Look at what he, he it says, in the hearing of all people, he systematically disassembled the Pharisees and what they believed. He didn't pull punches. He called the truth what the truth was. He didn't sit down and have a conversation with the Pharisees. Let's have a dialogue. No, he said, you guys are wrong. And you're going to hell. This was how Jesus preached. He confronted error, and he did it head on. The scribes were pompous, heartless, duplicitous people that lived for this world. Now, I want to end with this. Three ways from what we just looked at, I want to look at three ways that Jesus preached the gospel that our culture absolutely hates, okay? And because Jesus preached this way, I'm going to tell you this is how we're called to preach, okay? Three ways that Jesus preached the gospel that our culture absolutely hates. I'll give them to to you quickly. Number one, Jesus exposited the scriptures. He exposited the scriptures. This is not popular in our world. It's not popular, but Jesus did it. When Jesus made arguments, you know what he did? He went to the Old Testament. Even more unpopular. There are a lot of Christians today that are trying to divorce Christianity and evangelicalism from the Old Testament. It's outdated. God's too angry. Don't like it. Prominent pastors, huge influence in the West, are deciding that the Old Testament is better left out of Christianity. They're wrong. Jesus preached it without even an ounce of hesitation. He went to the Psalms. He went to Exodus. He went to the law. He went to Deuteronomy. He went to the prophets. Jesus preached the Old Testament. Now listen to me. As someone who's preaching the gospel, you need to understand that the Bible has way more credibility than you. You understand that? I don't get to stand up here and preach because I have a lot of credibility or because I'm really clever or because I, I, can, I can, can talk. You guys don't come here every week to hear me or Jeff or Jeremy talk. We are not good enough at that for you guys to come. You come here because you believe that this thing has authority over your life. That's what it means to be a Christian, right? And Jesus, unapologetically, he looked to the scriptures for his authority. That's what he pulled on. Listen to this. This is what a guy named Harry Emerson Fosdick, you can forget that name because it doesn't matter, okay? Henry Emerson Fosdick, he was the guy who lived in 1920. He was one of the founders of what we would now call the liberal movement of the Bible. They they basically were those that were trying to disassemble the credibility of the scriptures and say, we don't need the Bible to be Christians. Not true, okay? Here's what he said. Many preachers indulge habitually in what they call expository sermons. In case you're wondering, that's how we preach at Heritage. They take a passage from the scripture, like we just did, and proceeding on the assumption that the people attending the church that morning are deeply concerned about what the passage means, they spend their half hour or hour um, or more on historical exposition of the verse or chapter ending with some appended practical application to the auditors. That's where we're at right now in the sermon, in case you're wondering. He says this, could any procedure be more surely predestined to dullness? Now, you might be like, I actually kind of agree this has been really boring, and that's okay. (laughs) Who seriously supposes that as a matter of fact, one in 100 of the congregation cares to to start with what Moses, Isaiah, Paul, or John meant in those special verses, or came to church deeply concerned about it? Nobody else who talks to the public so assumes that the vital interests of the people are located in the meaning of words spoken 2,000 years ago. Eh, Sorry, bro. Not true. Listen to what he says at the end. The future, this is 1920, okay, he's dead now. The future belongs to a type of sermon which can be best described as an adventure in cooperative thinking. Did Oprah teach him stuff? I mean, where did he get, like... Now, and that, that's, that was back in 1920. This garbage is still around, okay? Listen to what Doug Paget said back in 2005. He's one of the leaders of the emergent movement. He said, our sermons are not lessons that precisely divine belief, so much as they are stories that welcome our hopes and ideas and participation. Here's the reality. 
Okay, here's the reality. Look at the statistics. There is one type of Christianity that is actually growing in the West. Do you know what it is? It is conservative Bible-believing people that believe the Bible. This, this garbage, this, this, this um, emergent movement, this liberal thinking of Christianity, it is actually in decline. You can see it. It's going away. Why? Because it's inconsistent. The world's not stupid. They're not stupid. They know that if we're being inconsistent with what we believe, if we say we stand on the Bible, but then we immediately embrace what the culture says about sexuality, about all of these things, they're like, that's duplicitous. I can't believe in a Bible that's not consistent. One of my, if you ever, ever want to Google it um, on YouTube or whatever, go and, and look John MacArthur, who's an awesome Bible preacher, John MacArthur on Larry King. It's hilarious. So John MacArthur gets on Larry King, and he's with this panel of guys. And everyone in the panel is like universalists, um, all these people that basically believe nothing at the same time. And John MacArthur just like believes the Bible. He's got his Bible sitting in front of him. And Larry King really likes John MacArthur because he goes across the panel and he says, okay, tell me, like, what does God think about homosexuality? And these guys are just like, uh, well, you know, you see, I mean... And they ask questions like, so are people going to go to hell if they don't believe in Jesus? And they go, well, you know, I mean, you see, like, I think that God really just loves everybody and blah, blah, blah. And then he gets to John MacArthur, and John just goes, the Bible says this. And it's just, you're like, there's clearly one guy on this panel that, that actually knows what he thinks. And it's, not, and it's because he doesn't believe what he thinks, he just believes what the Bible says. And I am just proud when I watch that to go, I'm so glad I believe in the word. Because it allows me to be consistent. Because I'm actually not very consistent. I change my mind a lot. But this thing stays the same. It is, a, it is one of the greatest pleasures I have in my life to be able to get up here and exposit the truth that does not change to you guys. The same truth that won Martin Luther to the cross. The same truth that Calvin preached. The same truth that the apostles believed. The same truth that people have been preaching for years and have been saving people is still true. In fact, we have more literal manuscripts now than we ever have before. Way more. We can see what was really written. We can study what the early church really believed, what Jesus actually said, and we have to proclaim that. Number two, the second thing Jesus preached that, that our culture absolutely hates. Secondly, Jesus proclaimed his lordship and deity. He proclaimed his lordship in deity, in our text, it says that he, the Father, will make Jesus' enemies his footstool. Jesus is the king. He's the king. There's no changing that. Here's the problem. What we've given people is we've given people a false gospel. A gospel that says that Jesus is your therapist. Jesus is your personal genie. Jesus is your access to worldly blessings in the perfect parking space right? Jesus is your ticket to heaven. He's your homeboy. He's your convenient sin forgiver, and he's your boyfriend. There's a lot of Jesus is my boyfriend songs out there. We don't sing them at Heritage, okay? Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. You know what Paul called himself? Slave. That's how he opened all his letters. Paul, slave of Jesus. You say, that's weird. Not if your master's really good. I can't think of anything more freeing than being a slave to Jesus Christ. Sign me up for that. Because he's in control. He's calling the shots, not me. I called the shots. It doesn't work well for me. He's better at it. Jesus is not a cruel dictator. He loves you far too much to let you continue ruining your life by calling the shots, amen? Thirdly, not only did Jesus exposit the scriptures and proclaim his lordship and deity, but we see clearly in his text, he also, he called them to think eternally. He called them to think eternally. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were different, but they had the same fundamental problem. You know what it was? They loved this world. They absolutely loved it. The Sadducees found a way to build a worldview so that they could absolutely wring out every ounce of joy and pleasure in this world. The Pharisees found a worldview in order to do the same thing. They devoured widows' houses. They were obsessed with themselves. They were religious, legalistic egotists. They loved this world. They loved it. They loved it so much that they killed the king of the next one. 
It's really interesting. I'll point this out in closing. There's a synoptic account of what we just studied when the Sadducees asked Jesus about the, the resurrection. The synoptic account is in Matthew 22. It's the same account, but it's from a different gospel writer. And just listen to what Jesus says in response to the Sadducees. Okay, the same thing we just studied, but listen to what Jesus adds, or what, what Matthew adds uh, that Jesus has says. After the, the, the Sadducees asked him this question, Jesus answered them saying, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. They were so obsessed with this world they could not fathom that there was something greater in the next one. All they could think about was this world. The weeds grew up, choked him out. The roots couldn't go down. And ultimately, they would perish. They both erased the idea of eternal accountability so they could live however they wanted. They both saw the law as a means of getting good now. You know, don't be, don't, don't be confused. Not all legalism is about people trying to do good so they can go to heaven. A lot of legalism is about people doing good so they can get something from God today and cash in, okay? If anybody ever tells you that you, you, you give your money so God will give you something back, tell them, eh, and you walk out the door, okay? It's not true. The point is not this life. It's never been this life. The point is the Lord. The point is his glory. They had their arms so tightly wrapped around this world. What is the call of the believer? The call of the believer is to die to this world and to be reborn into the next one. That's why we call it being born again. And by doing that, you no longer live into this age. You no longer live into this world. This is not your home. You're just passing through. All of your treasure, all of your inheritance, all of your security, all of anything that matters is in the next life. That's not escapism. It's reality. We live in a broken world. And God, when you've been reborn, God give you this new set of desires, this new passion that can only be fulfilled in the next life. That's why we're uncomfortable here. It's uncomfortable here. We don't belong here. What Jesus was trying to get these guys to see was that the next stage was where they needed to be living for. I mean, how else could Paul sit in prison? This guy, man, Paul the Apostle, he spent almost his entire ministry in prison. He didn't care. I mean, I'm sure it was hard. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if Christ did not raise from the dead, in other words, if there's no resurrection, we're most to be pitied. (laughs) Why? Because all our chips are in the next stage. You know what makes life so scary sometimes? Is that everything in this world is losable. You ever think about that? Everything in your life is losable. Your health, your mind, your kids, your wife, your husband, your job. Everything, it's all losable. No wonder we're scared and afraid and anxious. Everything you value can be gone. And in fact, at some point, it will be. Imagine how you would live if everything that mattered to you was completely secure, couldn't be lost, not losable. Imagine what your life would look like if this world was nothing more than a bonus for you, an opportunity to serve God and glorify God with your life because everything that really is most important is sealed because it's him. He is the value. It's the freedom of Christianity. That's the freedom that allowed people like Corey Ten Boone and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer who, who had the ability to access their national freedom during a time of, 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 the, uh, of terrible Holocaust. But rather, they chose to give up their life because their equity was in the next stage. Their equity was in a kingdom that was outside of this world. The single greatest evangelical m- tool that you have in your arsenal is for the world to see that you expect nothing from them and expect nothing from this world because all of your value is hidden in the next. Don't be surprised when people are offended by the gospel. You have a choice. You can preach it, you can change it. I suggest to you that you preach it and pray like crazy that God will raise the dead. Not just physically, but spiritually. Lord, thank you so much this morning for your word. I pray that we would be bold The gospel is good news. It's the best news. And even though it is the smell of death to those that are perishing, God, 
Help us to preach it anyways. We thank you so much for the resurrection. Lord, that Jesus, you were the first fruits that we get to follow in your steps, that we'll get to spend eternity, Lord, in a material universe with an interface to the spiritual universe, God, where, where you are there and present. Lord, that we're not limited anymore by these physical bodies, by our fallen minds. Thank you, Lord, for the good news of the gospel. We cherish it. We cherish you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.